So as we as we jump into this this book, we would have to say that this is one of the more commonly known stories in the church and, and in in the world of at large, because it's such a it's such a funny story with this whale and him running away and preaching. Um, but Crystal, what would you say we need to understand about Jonah's the, the man, the time, the place? What's going on so that we can make sense of what we're going to read on these pages before we dive into chapter one? Yeah, and you know, if you just read the book of Jonah, we, we don't really actually have a lot of information about him. You know, the first verse just talks about his father, Amitai, and we don't really have any other information, but thank goodness Jonah is mentioned elsewhere in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and so we can actually turn to 2 Kings 14 to find out some information about where Jonah's from, what time period he's from, and actually one of his oracles as well. So 2 Kings 14, it mentions Jonah, son of Amittai, uh, the prophet, who was of Gat Hefer. So we already kind of mentioned Gat Hefer. It's a, a fairly small village in the Galilee area, not too far from Nazareth. And if we go to verse 25, it talks about a king who was able to gain more territory for Israel, all the way from Hamat in Syria to the Sea of the Plain, which is the Dead Sea. All right, so if we look at verse 27, we actually can find the name of the king um, that Jonah worked with. So the name of the king is Jeroboam, and this is Jeroboam the second. And Jeroboam's reign dates to about 800 to 750 BC. So to kind of put it in context, um, Jonah is after Elijah and Elisha, but before Isaiah. What's, this is a fascinating time period. If you look at a king who rules for that long, you know there's enormous stability going on. If, if a king only rules for a couple of months, he's been executed or exiled, or even just a couple of years, if there's a lot of change going on with the kings and the leaders, there's a lot of chaos. So this is a time of a certain amount of peace and prosperity going on in Israel. And it's interesting because Assyria at this time is dealing with its own issues and is not as much of a threat to Israel as it had been a generation before and as it will be a generation after. And so in some ways, this might be a bit of a golden age for the state of Israel from an economic standpoint. But from a spiritual standpoint, there might be some serious issues going on. There might be a lot of peace and prosperity, but people are eating, drinking, being merry, and forgetting God. Yeah, and uh, this peace and prosperity is one of the reasons why Jonah is able to kind of freely travel wherever he wants to, to the coast, to Assyria, and you know that's a time of peace and prosperity if he's able to do that safely and freely. So when we get into the book of Micah, we'll see more of what is going on spiritually with the people when they're getting distracted with all this peace. Now, God wants us to have peace. He would love for us to have prosperity. But sometimes when that happens, people choose to say, my hand hath done this, and they forget God. And we'll see more of that with Micah. But in this story of Jonah, it's interesting that we have this prophet being sent to a foreign nation. How often in the Old Testament do we have prophets specifically directed towards a foreign nation for their mission. Um, I can't think of any other really strong examples. They'll they'll often write to other foreign nations, but they aren't often sent to that foreign nation. It seems to be an anomaly. In fact, on that note, if you look at the book of Jonah, this is a book of, of opposites. Everybody's acting differently, almost 180 degrees opposite of the way you would have expected. It's it's plot twist after plot twist, and, and people aren't in character, so to speak, whether it's the sailors, the, sh- the people on the ship, or Jonah the prophet, or the king in Nineveh, or the people in Nineveh, or even a whale. Everybody's acting differently than you would have expected in a, in a traditional story. Yeah, and, and it, the whole story is about repentance and forgiveness, which is about you know, maybe you're going one direction and you need to change and go the opposite direction. And so I love it because Jonah has to do that. The people of Nineveh have to do it. Um, And that's, I think, what the whole story is about, hope, repentance, forgiveness, um, and, you know, returning back to the Lord. Another thing that kind of sets this book of Jonah apart from others of, of the prophetic books in the Old Testament is 
it's written very differently. It's not as if Jonah's sitting down saying, here are my words that God gave to me, and, and here's what I did, and here's my story, let me tell it to you. It's not in first person. It's, it's as if it's written by somebody who's watching his story play out. It's a third person telling of his story, and quite frankly, Jonah, Jonah doesn't it, this story doesn't end on a high note, or it doesn't, it doesn't paint him in a really positive light. Um, so this is not an autobiography, it seems. And it seems that it's trying to say something about God's character and nature, and that Jonah and the people of Nineveh, the sailors, the whale, are all playing roles to help identify who God is. So that's helpful. So we'd love to learn about who these prophets are and who the ancient people are, but remember, God preserved his words so we can learn more about him. So as you're looking at this story, you might say, what is God trying to express about himself through these stories where you have people doing things that might be contrary to expectations? Yeah, and that's perfect because, you know, I mentioned that this is a story about repentance and hope, but it's also a story about God's love and that he loves everyone. No matter where you are, where you're from, whether you're part of the house of Israel or a Gentile or are in covenant or not, he loves everyone. And I think that's part of the message too, especially right at the end. I find it stunning that the Israelites would have preserved this story. So just a generation later, the Assyrians are now super powerful and they come into northern Israel, destroy the capital of Samaria, exile a bunch of people, kill people. It's very barbaric. And yet the Israelites preserve the story where it shows God's love and enduring kindness and grace to the Assyrians. And I just wonder, if some foreign nation came in and conquered my city and my people and killed a bunch of us, or had done that to my ancestors, would I want to preserve a story about how God was going to offer grace to this foreign nation that had done all these terrible deeds? So I find it really compelling that this story was preserved over so many generations by Israelites who had suffered at the hands of the Assyrians. Very so it ties into what you're talking about, forgiveness. It's not just God forgiving people, but even us learning to forgive the past where it doesn't always turn out the way we wish it would. 